Well, welcome to GBTA Canada's Town Hall for 2022. We are thrilled to be able to cap off an exceptional year on what has been a road to recovery as we continue to look ahead to 2023. So my name is Nancy Tudorosh, Regional Vice President for GBTA of the Americas, and we're pleased to provide you today our Town Hall in a virtual express version because we know while this is the most wonderful time of the year, it is also the busiest time of the year. So joining us today, we will have uh, content that we'll share around the 2023 Canadian landscape. We have some industry leaders on the ground here in Canada that will share views from the TMC space, the Canadian ground space, Canadian air and hotel spaces. And that'll be moderated today by two of our Canadian advisory board members and from the Global GBTA Board of Directors, Charlene Katwaru Nanu from Rogers Communications and Sue Spear from Sengage Learning. We will then share some very interesting data and optimistic data around our GBTA industry trends and outlook that is derived from our GBTA BTI business travel index and our forecast for the year ahead. So that will be presented by Chris Ely, our research director at GBTA. And then to cap it off, we'll give you some exciting information to make sure you lock in the dates for your calendar for GBTA Conference 2023 Toronto that will take place May 15th to 17 at the Metro Toronto Convention Center. So to get us started today, it is my pleasure to pass it over to Charlene Katwaru Nanu with Rogers Communications and GBTA Canada Advisory Board member and Board of Directors. So over to you, Charlene, to talk about views from the Canadian TMC space with Vaughn Nesbitt. Over to you, Charlene. Thank you so much, Nancy. It is a wonderful pleasure, as always, to be here with you and with uh, all of our audience members. Greetings to you from Toronto, Canada, in a meeting room, in a hotel, which I am super excited to be able to say. Um, let's jump right in and talk about what's happening in the Canadian landscape and what we, are, what we can look forward to in 2023 for the Canadian marketplace. I'd like to welcome now Fawn Nesbitt Fry, Director of Business Development at Direct Travel. Fawn is going to talk to us a little bit about what's happening in the Canadian TMC space. Fawn, over to you. Thank you, Charlene. Nice to be here and thanks for having me. Um, so from a Canadian TMC perspective, it's been, as we all know, a bit of a roller coaster over the last few years, um, but it looks like we're, we're on the upside of that. So just reflecting back on these last few years, um, as we all know, TMCs had actually fallen all the way down to 5% on average, or even less for some um, during the pandemic as compared to their 2019 numbers. Um, with that, just sharing a bit of stats in conjunction to help paint that picture. In 2019, we had over 300, sorry, over 3,000 accredited travel agencies. By the end of 2021, it was just over 2,000, so nearly a 30% um, decrease in agents, which unfortunately has affected us with a few different challenges. So some of the major challenges that we're experiencing um, and on the upswing of recovery from this would be labor shortages. I mean, we had a lot of downsizing. There was a mass resignation where lots of agents have moved on to other industries. Um, there was furloughs, et cetera. So, that was kind of a major um, impact on our industry and um, our ability to, to fulfill. Um, as well with the downstream of the impact of the airline disruptions, as we all know, schedules were constantly changing as they're trying to work out their current supply and demand. It's been in flux um, for most of this year. So TMCs were really uh, bogged down with being able to work through exchanges, refunds, often on the same booking. So each booking itself took a little bit more time, um, which certainly impacted timeframes. Then as well with the travel confusion of government restrictions. So we know in the US, there's a lot of inconsistencies um, crossing to and from borders there. Unfortunately, it's also affected the Canadian market in that travelers are still a little bit, there's a lot of ambig ambiguity towards what are the restrictions? Are there any, although you know they've been lifted, People still are uncertain about these factors. So um, due to that, it does take a little bit more time per request with those agents to work through those requests as the travelers are just trying to get a sense of what they need to be better prepared 
um, in terms of information and vaccination proof, for example. So if we look at the next slide, um, there are some, some measures and big steps that we're taking to improve these factors. So we've been investing in recruiting a lot of staff. We've been very fortunate um, in the industry to actually bring back a lot of those agents that had been furloughed. So there is a lot of talent that's coming back into the market. Um, lots of recruitment with colleges and universities and looking at different programs where people are specialized in these areas to bring those people and get them up fast running, um, getting them training and up to speed. And then the other major factor being AI. So it gave us the opportunity during the downtime as TMCs to really invest heavily in technology, um, things where AI can help with those more day-to-day -day simple um, requests and things such as retrieving invoices, itineraries, those requests that are ongoing, um, AI can play a part in that as well as online booking tools. Of course, those are being continuously vamped up to add more functionality and ease of use so that we can streamline those processes in conjunction with the services that, that are being offered. So those two paired up are, are making um, some really positive uh, impact in uh, our road to recovery. Lastly, um, there's a couple of things to keep in mind of um, the future that um, is just good food for thought to really inform your travelers um, and everyone um, when it comes to being on the road. Um, I know we've been saying this for a while about pack your patients, um, but there's still, you know, we are we are improving, but there's certainly an element of patience when it comes to working through those requests. Um, if, you know, something to consider would be when it comes to the SLAs, uh, you know, they're not quite necessarily up to 100% of the standard that the TMCs would like them to be. We're all aware of that, but if we can have a little bit of patience and space um, to give a little bit more time for those turnarounds on those itineraries as the agents are working hard to get through those. Um, consider holding off on any RFPs till there's a little bit more of a normalcy. 2023 is looking very positive to have more of that as the airlines are working out their schedules and it is starting to flatten in terms of the flux that has been going on um, this year. The other piece is uh, the lack of understanding and respect for agencies. So a lot of publicity and media have been speaking to just various factors of how, you know, don't worry about dealing with the airlines, your agent can be on hold for you for hours. So the better prepared that your travelers are and a little bit more informed they are uh, leaning on the technologies that the TMCs offer, such as Sherpa, being able to be very aware of restrictions. Those types of things can help alleviate hold times and really help expedite each of those um, each of those requests so that uh, we can all work more efficiently together. Thank you so much, Fawn, for that update. Um, it's no secret. We've all been dealing with so many challenges and our, our, you know, our poor agent friends have been really um, at the bottom of the totem pole and been taking a lot of abuse. I want to talk a little bit um, about some of the positives that you see for 2023. As we start to see recovery and we start to see things improve and get better and we start to see those SLAs shrink, let's talk a little bit about where you see opportunities for the TMC space in 2023. Absolutely. I mean, the big, the big takeaway for that would be in the, in the realm of technology. I mean, as much as we had that downtime as TMCs during the pandemic, it actually helped propel um, and expedite those projects that were kind of sitting in the roster for a while. And so various technologies are really going to help provide that hybrid model for our clients Things such as um, chatbots that can help, again, expedite those simple, simple requests that aren't bogging down an agent to work through. It can be very automated and streamlined. Another big piece would be in the realms of duty of care. So adding to those technologies um, really helps for travel bookers and coordinators to understand at any moment's notice where their travelers are, really have that intel and foresight um, to be more proactive so that when they are making those requests into the agents, it's from a more proactive standpoint instead of that reactive and now we're in the queue of the lineup with everybody else. So there's lots of technologies that are exciting that are coming down the lines and the online booking tools continue to add more functionality and TMCs are jumping all over that. 
That's great. I think that's fantastic news, not just for our travelers, but also for us as travel managers. You know, we all know that we want to be able to do it all in the palm of our hands and that little, you know, seven inch screen that we all carry around in our pockets. Um, so it's great news to hear that the TMCs have taken that time to invest in the technology um, as we move forward out of uh, COVID and into our recovery and hopefully back to normal um, in, in the coming year. So thank you very much, Fawn, for the update and for that view into the future in 2023. I'm now going to switch gears a little bit and we're gonna talk a little bit about the Canadian ground space. And now I'd like to introduce uh, Ian Dale, Vice President Business Development for Canada at Enterprise Holdings, who's gonna give us a view of the Canadian ground transportation space. Over to you, Ian. Thank you very much, Charlene. Uh, great to see you and, and uh, hi to everybody in the GBTA Canada community. So. Um, Today, I'm going to uh, follow on from, from uh, the last update we provided and talk about a couple of the, uh, the major um, issues or, or factors that are affecting the car rental industry. Um, and, and we'll start off by talking about uh, fleet and pricing. Um, you know, to be able to look forward, you, you, also, you really have to look back to start with. So, um, you know, without dwelling on, on all of the, the effects of the pandemic, but obviously fleets were minimized um, and then demand suddenly came back uh, with the reopening of the Canadian borders, which was timed with the summer peak, um, which is always a challenge um, for the car rental industry from, a, from an availability standpoint, uh, brings us kind of to where we are today and, and what we can look at going forward. So, um, you know, car rental industries, we're, we're always looking to uh, manage our fleets. And, and by that, what I mean is we need to have enough volume of vehicles to meet the demand. Uh, we need to have the right mix of car classes to meet the individual requirements of the demand. And we also like to have a healthy mix of manufacturers product to be able to offer customers choice. Um, and we love to have new vehicles um, for, that everybody obviously enjoys uh, driving. So some of the post-pandemic challenges that we face there um, still exist. Uh, and, and there is, you know, it, it, it's not easy to just replenish that fleet and, and get to the level that you need to. So a couple of statistics to kind of back that up. Uh, in 2019, the manufacturers in Canada sold 1.7 million vehicles total, okay? 10.5% of those were sold directly to uh, daily rental or car rental companies. So far in 2022, the manufacturers have only sold 4.3% of their total um, sales into daily rental. So the car rental companies are trying to buy vehicles and have been um, you know, since that re-emergence of demand, but we've only been um, allocated or able to secure 30% of the volume that we got in 2019. Um, the other thing that's also notable here, uh, when you look at the Canadian manufacturers, 17% of the vehicles that they produce and therefore sell are classified as car, meaning the other 83% are classified as SUV and truck. Now, that trend has been developing over the years, um, but that's something that you have to consider um, when you think about your travel policy and the fleet vehicles that will be available and potentially the pricing structure that you have to obtain those vehicles. Car rental companies are overcoming these challenges by a couple of strategies. One is you know, A, purchasing as many of those vehicles as we can, B, um, purchasing other vehicles, maybe not brand new to augment the fleet, um, and also uh, looking at a sustainable fleet, meaning retaining vehicles for longer, um, which does mean that some of those vehicles end up having higher mileage, um, but it's a way to be able to meet the demand. Since the summer peak, some of those things and availability has certainly got better, um, but there is a large chunk of unused new vehicles that were not produced. Microchip shortage is a, is a huge um, factor in that. And the average vehicle age in, in Canada outside of car rental is seven years old. So it will take a number of years for that large missing uh, chunk of new vehicles to kind of go through the, the country's fleet, as it were, uh, and for things to get back to normal from that perspective. 
Uh, another thing I'll just touch on here is uh, electric vehicles. It's it's obviously a, a um, talked about subject, uh, and car rental companies are introducing these into their fleet. So the major car rental companies do offer um, electric vehicles, but the percentage of electric vehicles, when you look at the total fleet, is still very, very small. So you are able to find some availability, but it's not going to, to necessarily be available at every location or every city. We still need infrastructure to improve across the country um, to support electric vehicles, which needs to come from both the federal, local, and the industry to be able to uh, pr progress that. And the rental companies are still working through some of the operational challenges or processes, such as to be able to charge them um, and the refueling options or recharging options for customers. So today, electric vehicles, um, you may find avail availability, but uh, a lot of car rental companies are targeting more niche companies or niche um, industries within the car rental space to be able to rent these vehicles. So the entertainment space is, is one such great example, uh, where the vehicles will be contained on one site uh, and not necessarily going all across the country and, and normally return to the same site overnight, which offers great charging opportunity there. Outside of that, um, pricing is, is obviously reflective of availability. Um, it has improved, like I said. Uh, we are in kind of the low season. Uh, when you look at retail pricing, it did drop from the summer, uh, which it always does, but it still remains elevated when you look at prior years. So as we look ahead, December through March, the winter months, retail pricing is still between 10 and 20% up from where it was last year. Uh, there are also some other costs, um, you know, the car buy I've talked about, obviously we were highly incentivized, um, as an industry to purchase vehicles that that's all that dynamic has changed completely. And, and, and now, um, you know, all of those incentives, um, are really taken off the table as, as we're trying to purchase vehicles and we're competing with the dealerships, fleet companies, and, and everybody else that, that is looking to do so. Um, but there are some other things which are very similar across other industries from a, from a cost standpoint. You know, personnel expense has certainly gone up. Um, vehicle repair costs, uh, so the length of the repair, um, but the cost of the repair also, uh, which is reflective of the number of parts that goes in and the technology that is built into these vehicles these days. Uh, it just means that the vehicle is going to take longer and cost more to, to be able to repair, repair and replace. Uh, and there's also a large number of um, auto manufacturer recalls more than ever before, uh, which puts a dent in our availability as, as we um, sit those vehicles to wait for, for those updates or repairs that are needed. So to kind of sum this up, the best practices um, that I would advise uh, are the same as they were previously, but you know, choose a partner that is going to uh, provide you with a negotiated rate because retail rates will continue to be elevated. Um, Look to get as much of your travel within that program as possible. Choose a partner that's going to have accessible account management to help guide you through um, because there is a lot of, uh, it's an ever-changing landscape. Make sure you book in advance wherever possible. Utilize the loyalty programs that are available because oftentimes that will improve your availability or give you access to um, upgraded customer service initiatives. And if possible, be flexible. Uh, you know, to 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 get the the right vehicle at the right place, um, there, some flexibility might be required in those in the peak seasons and as we look forward into summer. So, Charlene, that's uh, that's my overview for now. I expect you have a question for me. Oh, don't I always, Ian? <laughs> Thank you so much for that update. I know you know as travel managers, we do we are still consistently getting those phone calls from our our travelers about availability and pricing, um, and. All of those best practices are being, you know, being utilized by most of us. I do want to, again, talk about similar to what I, what I asked Fawn, I do want to talk about some opportunities, right? We, we as an industry have been battered. The ground, the ground industry is no different. Talk to me a little bit about where you see some opportunities for the ground transportation uh, industry in 2023. Yeah, for sure. And, and, you know, it's a, it's a similar answer to, to Fawn in that, um, the pandemic actually uh, helped us progress some of the initiatives that we were moving along 
with or, or had ideas about. Um, and it comes down to firstly, you know, investment in technology. Um, so, you know, as you think, uh, connected car fleets uh, are becoming a very real thing, which is going to, from from the the most basic level, just helps you return a vehicle a lot quicker, helps us access some information. Uh, it's going to help with the downtown downtime that I touched on because we'll have scheduled maintenance, things like that. Um, but then also, I would say the technology that we're investing in and developing is really about customer service initiatives. So continuing to, to you know, provide better ease of use um, and a seamless, you know, touchless experience. Um, and finally, I would just say, you know, we're listening to our customers at all time. Uh, and, and the one thing that we hear the, uh, a lot about right now is sustainability initiatives. So, um, you know, from, from us personally, you're going to see uh, a brand new sustainability package kind of announced very soon in the new year. Um, and I know that that's, that's uh, something that everyone's in tune with, especially in Canada. Uh, and I think the industry will step up uh, and, and provide what's needed for, for, for that. That's great. That's exciting news, Ian. I'm actually I'm looking forward to hearing that that announcement on sustainability, and I'm also glad to see that we're you know there are some initiatives around service levels and touchless, and and you know I think a lot of us have gotten used to touchless and self serve in the last little while, and so nice to know that our our partners are listening to us and to our travelers. Thank you so much, Ian, for this update and for this view on the landscape of the Canadian transportation space. Next, we're gonna hear from our colleagues on the view from the airspace and the hotel space here in Canada. Thanks, Charlene, and good morning, afternoon, everyone. It was great to hear from our TMC and Grand Transportation experts. Uh, we are going to move on now to our airline and accommodation segment experts. So first off, I'd like to introduce Chuck Crowder from WestJet. Chuck will be giving us a high level overview of the current landscape of the airline industry. Over to you. Great. Hi, Sue, and, and hello, everyone. Thanks for having me back. So much has changed since I was able to speak to everyone at a global convention in San Diego this past summer, and so much progress has been made in the airline sector and partnering with the Canadian government. Uh, some of the big things that went away the health policies we had for entry and exit into Canada was all removed in October, which was a huge benefit for travelers to help us through this. On the cats and immigration side, while we've seen great progress, we still wanna watch out um, as they're going through some hiring in the government to ensure that processing times are kept to a minimum and guests make it onto their connecting flights and in their destinations uh, properly. On the NAVCAN side, uh, again, great progress. However, hiring is still taking place. So we, airline sector is still watching out uh, for the way we route flights and if that adds extra time. In Toronto, the runway construction was successfully completed in November, which allows for better departure and arrival flow there. On the European side, we talked about over the summer where we saw restrictions on flights, especially into the UK and the Netherlands, a reduction because the throughput could not be as strong as they wanted it to be. While several of those restrictions have been removed, we are still watching that in some countries going forward uh, to ensure that we have the right level of capacity uh, based on demand. A big call out still that's a challenge in the Canadian sector is for passports and nexus. While we're starting to see that backlog start to diminish, there's still significant amounts of applications, especially on the nexus side that the team still needs to work through uh, in processing in connection uh, with the US as well. But what the airlines continue to do, really partnering with the Canadian government um, Border Patrol, NAVCAN, to ensure that we continually to drive efficiencies and improve processes and uh, throughput uh, in the system. A big part of that is technology enhancements and what we can do to digitize uh, these processes. You know, as I talked about earlier, ArriveCAN, that went away. Uh, it's not mandatory. However, it 
does help improve the process when immigrating back into Canada. And the government is looking at ways to build upon that platform in order to drive even better efficiencies uh, as we get uh, through the pandemic and into 2023 and beyond. Uh, some things that people need to be aware of is scheduling. We're starting to see a shift in capacity throughout Canada, uh, not only domestically, but in transborder and international markets. So you really need to be thinking about maybe flights that you took previously, that, that schedule may have changed and how uh, that will impact your travel going forward. The cost of fuel is still a concern for airlines. And what does that do in terms of ticket prices, uh, not now, but in future, because that forward curve of fuel still is showing that it's going to be high out there. Uh, the airlines continue to work through labor uh, concerns and issues, uh, especially on the pilot side. Uh, there's still significant demand for pilots out there. So we do partner uh, with all the unions on how to really attract and retain talent uh, in Canada so we don't see our pilots uh, go into other countries and fly for competing airlines out there. Uh, and then we just always have to be aware of changes of what's going on in the marketplace, not only with immigration, but within our own domestic markets, uh, scheduling pricing to ensure that uh, we're consistent on understanding any nuances that may uh, show up. Uh, so, but I, I am thankful to say so much progress has been made in the last five and, or six months. We're on a great trajectory uh, to continue this out into 2023. So thanks for having me, Sue. Thanks, Chuck. We've always spoken about, you know, making sure travelers are educating themselves and staying on top of all the timing rules and regulations. So that awareness is definitely key. But what are some of the additional opportunities you see for the air industry in 2023? Education is always number one. And that's why I always say really come back to the GBTA hub and all the information GBTA sends out to ensure that you are up to date on what the current trends are in the marketplace. Because we've seen as Canada has really started to shift out of that mindset of COVID and COVID restrictions, a lot of countries are not there yet. I recently traveled into Japan and there's still a lot of restrictions going in there. So that education and awareness, we can't settle back into our old ways of thinking, just really be at the forefront. And I can't think of a better place to get that information than at GBTA. Thanks, Chuck. That's great. It's really valuable information for everyone. Thanks. So I am going to shift things a little bit. So now I'd like to introduce Tim Oldfield from Marriott. Tim will be giving us a high level overview of the current landscape of the hotel industry. Tim, off to you. Terrific. Thanks, Sue. It's good to be with everyone today. Uh, I, I think so many of the comments that uh, Chuck made in the airline sector have some applicability in the, in the broader travel uh, ecosystem. Um, but there are some things that are kind of unique to the uh, hotel landscape, and we'll talk about them. I think one thing that we are all really grateful for is that as we progressed through 2022, we saw the pandemic uh, begin to recede in much of the world. And that meant a return to normal, even if that was a new normal where we learned to live alongside COVID-19. And we saw people as a result of that kind of receding of the pandemic cause people to want to have more time together. And togetherness was a, a, a big theme throughout the year. We saw people traveling for work, traveling for conferences, uh, for family reasons, for fun reasons, for celebration. And sometimes we're now starting to see this uh, blending of multi-purposes. So the landscape is going to continue to change. I think though that as we take a look at the back end of 22, moving into 2023, there, there are kind of probably four areas that this audience um, really rallies around. And, and, and these kind of four things you see on the screen right now that I think are incredibly important for a keen understanding. As we go through uh, the back end of 2022, all buyers have seen the rate pressure in many markets. 
And this is coming out of a number of facets. Uh, you think about the compression from a group. Um, groups came back fairly quickly uh, after the pandemic, certainly faster than business travel did. So I think the, the new patterns, the shifting of so many programs over the last couple of years into a fairly condensed time frame certainly has led to, to group compression. Uh, we see it from the leisure side. The overall high demand for leisure is taking some of those rooms out of the market. Yeah, hoteliers and hotel owners will, will talk to you about uh, increased costs for doing business, and that certainly is a piece of that. Uh, we're a business that is uh, heavily reliant on uh, on labor, and that means we do have some costs. And certainly on the, the food and beverage side, you'll you'll see increased costs in in that uh, space. But there's one other dynamic that uh, that not everyone's aware of is that in many of the major cities, we've got reduced room inventory. Hotel construction slowed. So the replacement hotels that typically come online, the, the, they were slower to, uh, to finalize through the last couple of years. And we've also seen the repurposing of a number of hotels in certainly major markets in Canada. All of that has put some pressure on, uh, on room availability. And certainly when you're buying these days, you'll see that. That buying knowledge is turning into some RFP realities. And, and through the year, we saw a number of our key travel buyers delaying the launch of their 2023 RFP for hotels. Uh, and that was a, a number of reasons for that. There were some labor shortages on, uh, on the, either the buyer side or the TMC side and their ability to process. But also so many buyers wanted to be educated and have good data. And the longer they could wait uh, to get better data would help them in delivering a, a good RFP. Uh, reduced travel uh, across corporate spending is one of those areas that we continue to take a look at. The industry generally uh, is back to about a 75% level of index to 2019. But the visibility into what travel looks like going forward is one of the things that travel buyers are talking to us about to say, we think it's coming back to X level, but we're not sure yet. We will know more as we move into 2023. And, and that causes a little bit of, uh, of angst during the RFP process. And certainly introducing new products, whether that's more dynamic or float discounts, the introduction of NLRA, uh, those types of dynamics that we're seeing all lead into a more complex pricing season for our RFPs. And certainly travel buyers and, and the supply side are having a lot of conversations around that. One area where I think both sides come together because it is so critical is the traveler experience. And it has changed. I think a lot of that is the acceleration of change that was likely to come anyway. And you see that things like digital self-service and people pulling out their phone to do more, whether that's change the channel on their television, check into a room, mobile key, um, checking out, uh, chat with a front desk. I think those are things that the industry was well positioned to take advantage of and Feedback from travelers is we love it. We also love the ability to go to the front desk and have human interaction as well. But there are other areas of the traveler experience that are looking a little bit different today. And we call it light touch housekeeping. Um, but if you've stayed in a hotel, you, you may uh, be getting housekeeping service every other day. You will uh, have different types of interaction with the housekeeping team. So I think those are things that uh, are good for us for a number of perspectives. One, helping us manage labor to uh, giving travelers the experience they want, which is sometimes I don't need somebody in my room every day. I don't need my towels refreshed. But the other part of it's really important around CSR and corporate social responsibility. Uh, cleaning, laundering, less sheets and towels is good for the environment. And, and I haven't been able to find a buyer yet this year that doesn't prioritize and place a great deal of emphasis on the whole sustainability uh, concept because we're moving into our future together. So I think those things are changing the traveler experience. And, and frankly, I think they're changing them for the better. And that will continue as we move forward into 2023. A couple of things that I think we're all feeling about 2023. There's a risk of a modest recession in Canada. The experts are saying it is sh likely short-lived, um, but nonetheless, the R word is out there and we've, we've got to be aware of it. I think that we think about demand returning and uh, buyers have got pretty comfortable in that 70, 75, 80% return to travel range. We'll see how that evolves as we get into 2023. And I think we'll learn a lot together. But the other thing that, that I, I think is going to be important for us all to be aware of is that uh, the group demand in 2023 is strong. Uh, that means there are going to be full hotels. Uh, and we're also seeing Canada 
once again as a favored destination for for leisure traveler uh, travelers and for international visitors uh, for, um, for for business and Congress. So I think all of those things point to uh, a, a pretty strong 2023 for our for our business too. All right. Thanks, Tim. I think all of us can see the demand for hotel space coming back at a pretty quick pace. Um, what are some of the additional opportunities you see for the hotel industry in 2023? Yeah, so, so the I think there are a couple things that I would want to mention. For the hotel industry on, on our side, that is about warmly embracing the changes to hospitality as, as we move forward. I think that is something that every hotelier has got on, on their mind. But I think in the context of the audience that we're really talking with today, I, I think it's collaboration. The, the collaboration that we saw through the pandemic, coming out of into recovery, through recovery, but this is about how do we travel uh, purposefully? How do we travel better? How do we support our, our shared customer, the, whether that is the, the, the employee traveling and staying in one of our hotels? But that's also about technology. It's about innovation. And, and I think that uh, buyers and suppliers coming together to innovate and rethink how we work together to deliver uh, that incredible traveler experience is so important. And, and, and GBTA has such a great role to play in that, not only as a community, but also as a resource uh, for buyers and sellers in, in that environment. So collaboration is the word I would use. Sue. Thank you, Tim. Good word to use, collaboration. Um, thank you both uh, for your outlooks as expert segment or segment experts, and I will pass it back to Nancy. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, that was uh, great to hear, um, you know, the overall landscape of what we're seeing here in Canada. So Sue, Chuck, Tim, thank you for sharing your insights around air and accommodations. And of course, a little bit earlier, we heard from Charlene, Fawn and Ian on ground transportation and TMC. Um, all righty. So at this point now, we are going to move on to Chris Ely, our research director with GBTA, and he's going to talk to us about the GBTA outlook and industry trends, some really important data that we've uh, been able to accumulate through our research through our BTI, our business travel index, along with some forecast numbers that I think you'll find absolutely fascinating to be able to record for your outlook as you progress into 2023. So right now, we'll pass it over to Chris Ely. Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar. My name is Chris Ely. I am the research director at GBTA and I'm gonna share some industry trends and outlook and we're gonna look at uh, global trends but also with a for, uh, focus on Canada. I wanna take a step back and think about um, where we've been and where the industry has been in the past looking where, and looking where we might be going forward. And what I wanna share with you on this slide is that the industry has always, has had hiccups in the past. We've had the early recession in the early 2000s after 9-11. We had the deep recession in 2008 with the financial collapse. And then of course, we've had the COVID crisis in 2020. Um, and yet we what the trend we see is that the industry always comes back. And we are very optimistic that the industry will come back and will continue to grow and thrive. Um, you noticed here that the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, we say uh, note here that the business travel spend, global tr business travel spend, declined about fifty four percent. But you know, if you think about it in terms of Q one of twenty twenty, was actually a very good quarter. And so, um, and then the, because Q two is when the lockdowns began, and the industry and everything came to a halt. But if we were to look at uh, just comparing. Q2, Q3, and Q4 of 2020 against Q2, Q3, and Q4 of 2019, that decline would be closer to 70%. So that one good quarter essentially pulled it up, for lack of better expression, to about a 54% decline. But now we're looking at some recovery. And over the next time frame of, of the next five, four to five years, we're looking at an, an increase of business travel spend on average of about 16%. We're going to get into a little bit more of that in a few more slides the state of domestic business travel. And this is from our most recent uh, quarterly poll. I'm sure many of you are familiar with our poll. Uh, it's We moved it to a quarterly poll. Um, but we're looking at, our most recent poll was in October of this year. And we found when we asked uh, travel managers and stakeholders uh, if their companies allow at least some uh, level of domestic business travel within your country, 
uh, we found on average, it's about 86% of, of respondents of travel managers and companies say that their company does allow at least some domestic business travel. Now, that's an increase uh, from a year prior when it was about 75% of uh, buyers and, and stakeholders who said the same thing about domestic travel. So let's take a look at it in terms of Canada specifically. So I see here the blue line. That's all companies all across the globe. Uh, but in terms of for Canada specifically, 78% of Canadian-based or Canada-based respondents said their company company allows at least some domestic business travel within Canada. And back in October of 2021, that was 63%. So again, we're seeing growth uh, across the world, including Canada. Let's talk a little bit about also where that is now, now in terms of relation to 2019, uh, a high year. So when we asked, okay, so your company does allow some business, domestic business travel, maybe not as much as, as back in 2019, or maybe there's not as much, but approximately what percent of business travel are you at? If you had to average it out or estimate what it was. And so on, it, across the globe, it's about 63%. So that means 63% uh, of travel managers say that their domestic business travel is about 63% on average of what it was uh, compared to 2019. In the US, it mirrors that about 64%, but for Canada, it's a little bit lower, uh, where Canada-based travel managers and stakeholders are saying it's about, hovers about 55% currently compared to what it was back in 2019. Um, I, flagged it here, our base is a little low of Canada-based specific uh, of, of travel managers and stakeholders who responded to this question, but directionally, this is certainly what we're seeing um, in terms of Canada and where it was, where it is now compared to where it was back in uh, 2019. Um, let's take a look at international business travel for a minute. Uh, so we have here, uh, again, the average is about 68%, so about, you know, an average uh, about 68% of companies say that they are they allow at least some level of international business travel. Um, back in 2021, uh, in October 2021, that was about 45%. So we're seeing growth there as well. Uh, currently, about 41% of Canada-based travel managers and companies say that they uh, allow some international business travel. Um, and it, it's on par with where we saw about last year, uh, when it was about 45%. Canada opened up a little bit later. Um, than maybe the U.S. and other countries in the world, which might explain uh, some of the some of the lower amounts of uh, volume per se. But then in thinking about percentage-wise, so globally, um, travel managers estimate about they're about fifty percent in terms of international business travel volume compared to where they were back in twenty nineteen. Um, and so in North America, I'm sorry, the U.S. Uh, it was about fifty one percent, and in Canada. It's about 40% of what it was. So let's take a look at bookings and supplier bookings. And this is just global where we're at right now in terms of how um, global bookings have changed. Um, and so we're about, in October, we found about bookings have increased um, about you know 79% um, compared to the previous month um, on average. So that's it's on par with what we saw earlier in the year in June. Uh, with 84%, maybe a little bit lower than March of 2022 um, as well. But we're seeing about, the, we see, what this is showing us is we're seeing growth and upward growth in terms of the number of supplier bookings um, that suppliers are seeing compared to the previous month, which is really positive news for the industry. Uh, so let's take a look at how global business travel spend is allocated or how it's distributed. And we see here, when we look at our forecast for global uh, business travel spend, this is looking at 2021, um, we're going to get into those specific numbers in a minute, but about 24% of total global business travel spend is, is, is in North America. That's about 24%. APAC, uh, Asia still is the, the highest with about 50% or about 407 billion. Europe, about 20% or 225 billion. Latin America, about 42 billion, which accounts for about 4% of total global business travel spend. M Middle East and Africa, about 2%, about, which is about 23%, uh, 23 billion, excuse me, of global business travel spend. So that's how we see things distributed in terms of 2021. Um, we'll have to wait you know, until next year to see how, it, how the 2022 compared once we have full year data. But this is, gives an indication that still APAC is still the largest uh, Travel business travel region by spend, um, even with China 
um, still having a, a tight lockdown uh, period uh, uh, right now. Um, but we've seen North America about a quarter of that and Europe about 20% of it. Okay. And so, you know, the, the benchmark that we use, the 2019 was the globe, was the highest we've ever measured in terms of uh, travel, business travel spend, about $1.4 trillion. Um, and so what are some of the things that are impacting us getting up back to there and, and, and have actually improved the uh, or the um, uptick in business travel and consequently business travel spend. Um, you know, certainly we see the rollout. We have you know vaccines that are now available, declines in COVID, even though we're seeing some uptick right now, but the advent of, of effective vaccines certainly helps um, enormously. Business travelers, they want to get back on the road. We see that in our sentiment studies and, and surveys that there's a high willingness to get back on the road. Uh, borders and corporate travel policies are opening up. Um, you know, we're seeing supply chains um, easing a little bit um, in some levels, which it certainly helps. Um, but and we're also seeing you know more efforts to combat inflation and increase costs, particularly in labor. I'm gonna to speak to that a little bit later, um, but certainly inflation is something to keep in mind because it is a global event. But some other, I mean, we're also being impacted. There are you know, geopolitical events, uh, the, the war in Ukraine, which is you know, having a, an impact in terms of business travel, particularly in some areas, of, particularly in Europe, but also impacting um, energy prices and thus also impacting um, you know, inflation. And then the rate of recovery in Asia is something also that we're still seeing, um, you know, even though China has opened up a little bit more, um, we're securing the news just today and over the last week about upticks in COVID infection rates despite um, opening up uh, the country and then easing some of the lockdowns and restrictions. So there's a lot of factors at play um, that will help and also hinder us getting back to that 1.4 trillion mark. Let's just take a look at sort of the top 15 business travel markets. And I flagged here down below, you see Canada. Um, in about in 2022, we forecast it's going to be about 15 billion, 15.2 billion US dollars in total business travel spend. That's an increase of about 47% from last year. So you see here, this is just our for each market. I've broken out the the, the forecasted um, travel business travel spend for each of our the top markets, and then how that compares to the previous year. So China, you know, still the largest at 286, 287 billion dollars, but that's still only you know seven percent growth compared to the previous year because of the, some of the points I mentioned as well. But we're seeing in most markets across the board double digit, in fact, strong double digit growth. Um, in 2022 uh, expected business travel spend compared to last year. And again, thinking back to some of those reasons that I mentioned, um, it's helping to contribute uh, a lot of that to the, a lot of that growth. So let's just take a look at where we are, where our forecast this is global before we kind of drill down into Canada specific. So here you see this chart that, um, again, it's our high year was about 1.4 trillion US dollars. Um, then with the decline uh, with, the, with the pandemic, you know, it hit about 661 billion. But here we see um, st uh, steady, strong growth through our forecast period. One of the things that I think is also important worth mentioning is that when we forecasted global business travel spend from our business travel index last year, when we released it at our event in Orlando, um, we had expected to hit this 1.4 trillion mark in 2025. And we're almost there, but we had to ratchet down some of those expectations, uh, some of that for growth uh, for 2025. So we're almost there, uh, close to rounding error. I think we are there, but we will be there. But really, it's going to be about 2026 before we hit um, that 1.4 trillion mark to be on par with uh, uh, what we saw in in, in 2019. Um, and so, you know, again, I just have some notes here. You know, in terms of you know recovery, we, we projected this. You know, this year will be about 34 percent, or about 933 billion. That's about 65 percent on average of about of what where we where we were back in 2019. Um, you know, we are seeing you know, economic conditions shifting and, and trends that are slowing the global economy. Um, you know, certainly 
you know, we know, like, for example, the UK is officially in recession. Um, all eyes are on, uh, you know, other countries around the world, including the US. Will, will we be in a recession uh, next year or not? Um, and same thing with Canada. Some economists are saying we might just actually be able to avoid it. Some might be able to say, might, some might say we're, we are going to hit at least a mild recession. But we're also seeing things like interest rate increases just today. Uh, the US Federal Reserve raised its interest rate. Um, but we're, but I think there are a lot of different headwinds going uh, going on right now, which is actually slowing some of the recovery growth that uh, we, we saw, which again results in us having to push our uh, our sort of make up or make make reaching uh, 2019's level out about another 18 months or so. So you know, 2025, I mentioned we're close. We're getting really close to that 1.4 trillion. Um, but it's again some of the headwinds, due to some of the headwinds. It's, it added about additional eight to approximately 18 months um, to our forecast to hit that 1.4 trillion mark. What about Canada? And so here we see uh, in 2019, uh, which was a high, uh, one of the highest level for Canada in terms of business travel spend, about 25, almost 26 billion US dollars. Um, due to the pandemic, it fell about 50, almost 50, 55% approximately to about 11.7 billion had a, a continued decline in 2021 to about 10.3, 10.4 billion. Um, Canada certainly had a tighter uh, border controls and travel restrictions on many levels and then and compared to many countries in 2021. But then we're seeing growth um, year over year and we expect that Canada will reach its 2019 high of 25 0.7 billion actually a year earlier. We're still forecasting that'll come in 2025 instead of 2026. So Canada's forecast at this point to, to hit that high mark at least a year earlier than the rest of many, many countries in the world and also the global average. Let's take a look. I just have some points here about just sort of some of the different industries. Um, you know, you saw in the previous chart that Canada's business travel spend it fell for two consecutive years, uh, down to about 10 billion in 2021. Um, you know, economic activity was muted in January 2022 due to Omicron, but momentum picked up quickly in February. Um, we expect Canada's business market to eclipse 26 billion in 2025, exceeding its pre-pandemic levels, which is great news. Um, certain industries are poised to grow a little bit faster um, than other industries, particularly the accommodation and food services industries and also the arts and entertainment uh, and recreation sectors. They're poised, poised to grow about 61 and 72 percent respectively compared to on average. And when looking at all industries in Canada, it's about 47, 46.8 percent for Canada overall. So certain industries will grow at a different uh, faster speeds than others. And we also expect over the next five years that um, travel spending in the manufacturing and utilities to have about a 19% growth compared to 20 plus growth in other sectors. Uh, but it's on par, but there's some, some, some differences. Again, speaking to the fact that different industries will recover uh, slightly different rates. I thought that would be interesting also to share just our forecast uh, that we do in partnership with CWT on pricing for air, ground, and hotel. And what we found in 2022, our forecast was the average, starting with airfare, average air ticket price is about $808. We forecast it to grow up, go up to about $900. This is still priced in US dollars, not Canadian. Uh, hotels, uh, seeing an uptick from about 147 to 157, and about car rentals about 41 from 41 dollars a day on average to about 43 dollars a day on average. What's driving some of these price increases uh, can include um, inflation, higher higher labor costs, um, and also higher fuel prices um, as well are all impact, impacting a lot of this growth. Um, it, going forward, but we are seeing, we are expecting some some modest increases in the average price uh, for these three verticals in Canada looking to next year. Uh, what about Canadian travels runners? When you ask them about, you know, what are, the, what are their expectations for next year? And we find that all Canadian travel managers we surveyed um, said they expect their number of business trips will be higher 
uh, next year than it was this year. So about six and 10 or 63% say they think it's going to be just higher, whereas about a third say expected to be much higher than it was this year. So that's positive news and it's a great news story um, that we're expecting uh, the Canadian travel managers are expecting more growth in terms of the number of business trips uh, by their employees next year. Some of those headwinds we're talking about, I mean, you know, all eyes are sort of looking at what might next year look like and what that might mean to business travel. And with this from our recent poll, um, and this is a global, all respondents, um, but we don't see a lot of companies, at least now, already implementing are already limiting uh, business travel right now because of economic concerns. So about 8% say they or they are, but 18% say they're considering, but they haven't made it to any decision yet. About 45% say that they, they're, they're taking a wait and see approach, but they're not at this point seriously considering limiting business travel because of the economic concerns. And about a third say that they are likely to, un, they're, they're unlikely to limit business travel because of economic concerns. So we see that the general direction trend is that uh, while there might be some, you know, people are certainly taking a look at this and watching the economy at this point, they're not, they're not limiting or restricting business travel because of economic concerns. Um, and then also what are some of those headwinds as well? It's interesting though, that what, what we asked, well, what might be likely to reduce it, I mean, business travel and Act Eight and Ten. The strong majority said if they do start limiting or reducing business travel year next year, it's going to be because of economic conditions, whether it's recession um, or companies tightening or tightening or freezing their budgets. Only four percent said it would likely be due because of COVID, um, and particularly employee unwillingness to travel because of COVID. Um, there's some few other reasons, but overall, the the main economic uh, headwind that might potentially impact uh, business travel in Canada is the economy um, and also across the globe, not just Canada, but also across the globe is the economy, not necessarily COVID per se. Um, one other thing I want to share with our, from our recent poll, which I think would be interesting uh, for the audience to know is that, you know, we're looking at, we hear a lot of talk about um, in, in the office policy and well, hybrid work and what's going on. So when we ask, you know, what best describes your company's uh, current work from office, in office, or work from home policy, almost 70%, this is global, say most employees, it's, they have a hybrid approach. Most employees are required or expected to work from the office some days, but are permitted to work from home other days. Um, about, but one in five, 20% say that they are fully remote. Employees are allowed or expected to work from home most or all days. Few, only about one in five, say that they expect uh, they, they're, they're full-time back in office. So I think that this is, you know, as we're looking at what the office policies and being in the office, but also what that means, some of the implications that might mean for business travel, um, this is, it's important to note that really, it seems like the majority of uh, companies around the world are have a hybrid sort of approach with some days in the office, some days from home. Um, and then, but then the question is, is that will this new arrangement uh, this flexibility impact business travel, and seven and ten travel managers say it will not impact the number of business trips taken by their employees. Um, and in fact, a few, about fourteen percent, say that it actually might result in employees taking even more business trips. Uh, but only about fourteen percent as well say that the flex this flexibility will actually result in employees taking fewer business trips. And so we we see that as companies adapt. And as workforce evolves and expectations change, this new flexibility, though, still is not anticipated to impact um, working from home. Uh, working from home will, will reduce the number of business trips taken by employees. So those are just some key findings uh, from our, our recent poll and some of our research. I hope you find this uh, interesting and I have here my contact information. Please feel free at any time to reach out to me. My email address is, is right there and I'm happy to answer any questions you have or dig around and see if GBTA might have um, any, any data that can help answer your, your questions. So thank you very much for attending. It's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you very much. All right. Well, thanks so much, Chris. Uh, we appreciate uh, the insight there. And again, there's some fantastic numbers that I think everybody will probably go back and rewatch this recording um, of the GBTA Canada Town Hall to ensure that you're getting those numbers and stats uh, into your plans for 2023. 
All right. So at this point, I had mentioned earlier, we would talk about our GBTA Canada conference. And I'm really excited that GBTA Canada is returning May 15 to 17 for GBTA Conference 2023 Toronto. We will be back at the Metro Toronto Convention Center. We're really excited to have a brand new full on conference restarted, reinvigorated here in Toronto. We will have more networking, more expo time with more exhibitors. We will have our education sessions and ample keynote speakers and subject matter experts on our main stage. So please mark your calendars, May 15 to 17 at the Metro Toronto Convention Center. And don't forget, we will also have our fabulous pinnacle event, the big night out. So all of this is coming in Toronto uh, for May of 23. Looking forward to seeing you all there and reconnecting with everybody as we progress into the new year. And with that, it has been a pleasure to serve you in 2022. We've had such a, a dynamic year, uh, one that has been full of rebuilding, reestablishing connections and opportunities and looking ahead to 2023. There's so much more that we will all continue to be able to come together and evolve further with the business travel sector in Canada. I wish you all a very safe, healthy and happy holiday season. Take time to reconnect and recharge with yourself, with your loved ones, and wish you all the best for 2023. Happy New Year.